and we are live. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the, uh, I think, final, um, right? Or are we going to do one yep. more? Final uh, um, hangout for this section, part one of asset pricing. I hope you'll all be joining us, of course, for part two of asset pricing. Uh, I'm John Cochran. Uh, we have here uh, Adam Jaring, our TA, and Hello. also from Japan. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Yuki, and let everyone know who you are. Uh, uh, okay, I'm Yuki. I'm a PhD student at in Tokyo. So and I'm, I'm doing. Uh, I'm uh, I'm studying economics. Well, welcome, Yuki. Um, so to get things going, uh, why don't, uh, Yuki, what's on your mind? What can we? Uh, do you have some questions or things you want to talk about with us this morning? Uh, Yuki, that's for you. Do you, no, do you have okay. a question or something we can? Something that's on your mind. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, about uh, related to week six last last week. So in the lecture, uh, I think you mentioned the state variable and uh, which predict the future uh, income, uh, so uh, income or something. But I'm still not. Uh, I don't quite understand what is uh, actual uh, the state variable or is there any uh, good literature research to find out what is the state variable? For example, in the, the Pharma French's paper, I think they so uh, they they say they have not identified the two state variable which uh, corresponding to uh, HML or SMB. So, is there any going research or is there not still? Yes, uh, so um, the first question on the state variables, what do we really mean by state variable for income? Um, so this, let me tell a story. Suppose your, uh, your boss comes in and says, you know what, we're going to double the salaries for all TAs, RAs, and graduate students, but that's effective six months from now. Uh, so you don't get any more money now, but you know, university procedures, six months from now, you're all getting your checks doubled. What do you do? You go out to dinner tonight, right? It's great news. Six months yeah. from now, you're going to have lots of money. That's great news uh, to you. That raises consumption, lowers marginal utility of consumption. Um, that acts in exact, many, many ways like the endowment shock of the uh, economies we've been thinking of. So um, in, the, in that sort of uh, Merton ICAP and framework, uh, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a variable that affects consumption and affects marginal utility consumption. So the, the idea of this framework is don't look at consumption directly. Instead, look at, at determinants of consumption. And news about future income opportunities is, is a news of consumption. And therefore, that can substitute for consumption and be one of your state variables. That's a state variable for investment opportunities. Uh, similar, you know, it's easier to think of hedging in the bad news. If they say, if the boss comes in six months from now and says, we're canceling the PhD program, you guys are all, you know, good luck driving for Uber six months from now. That's bad news. Consumption goes down. You would want to hold stocks that hedge that bad news. Uh, if that's an aggregate shock, everyone will want to hold stocks that hedge that bad news so that when you can't observe consumption directly, this is all in theory, um, observing those, those news shocks would, would allow you to, uh, to, to find the things that, you know, that drive expected returns around. Now, for reality, yeah, Baum and French wrote that beautiful paragraph about, uh, about uh, hedging for labor income shocks. And so that their vision is that uh, HML is a state variable like that, uh, that HML is, 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 a, is a mimic. That's why we keep doing all these mimicking portfolio ideas. They think they've backed up the procedure. Rather than finding consumption, finding the state variable that drives consumption, finding a mimicking portfolio for the state variable and, and then seeing how that works in asset returns, they kind of figured that they went the other way and found mm -hmm. the mimicking portfolio. They just don't know quite what it's a mimicking portfolio for. And the point of that paragraph is to suggest, boy, we think it sounds like a mimicking portfolio for, for labor income risks. Uh, yes, a huge, I, I can't cite papers off the top of my head, uh, but it is a ongoing, very active uh, field of research. This is, you know, what, what we do. Uh, there's hundreds of papers, if you will, okay. trying to link macroeconomics to, to stock prices and the value premium in particular. So what are the macro shocks having to do with the, uh, uh, the, the value premium? So that's, uh, I, I would call it active but unanswered in the sense, well, answered 
now all the, the, the hundreds of authors of those papers are going to get mad at me. Uh, there's many answers, and we haven't settled on, on one yet. Adam, uh, now Adam has been through Jean Fama's version of the Fama and French model. Uh, what, do we, what can you help us with there? Um, I, I unfortunately blacked out sort of half of your answer, so I don't know how much you, you going covered. Going to sleep again, eh? <laughs> going to sleep again, yes. That's, that's what daylight savings time does. <laughs> um, but I, I imagine that, that you talked about sort of the um, whether or not we, we, we think of HML precisely as, as the risk that, 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 or sort of as a risk we understand, or as a, a mimicking factor for um, general macro risk in, in the economy. So what, what is it that isn't sucked away from idiosyncratic uh, risk? What, it, what, what is it that you get, um, sort of, to, that you take uh, um, a factor loading a against. So, what what um, what have we seen recently? What would be um, sort of an, an applied setting of this? So, on on Friday, for example, um, when um, there was news reports that um, labor markets are doing well, and that would increase. Um, the risk or the, the, the probability of uh, increase in, in f uh, Fed rates in the future. And that meant that most assets went down sort of in sync. So that would be an example of something that where that, or that would be a difficult risk to sort of hedge away just by, by diversifying. Um, so Adam, and, you said a couple of great things I just want to, so you said you made three great points that I want to emphasize for, for one is this, there's this beautiful applied puzzle. This could be a final exam question. What the heck is going on that um, uh, we get great news about the economy and the future economy? Labor markets are doing better, uh, economic growth to come, and the stock market goes down? You know, how, you know, have we just proved irrationality, behavioral finance, arbitrage limits, whatever you want to call it? No, right? This, is, this course is built around, hey, there are discount rate effects, and when we get good news about the economy. We've, this is one reason. We, we, I've done this problem about five times in the homeworks, that you get good news about the economy, the interest rate goes up, the expected future interest rates go up, the discount rate goes up, and the effect of, in fact, we, ran, we worked this out, gamma greater than one, good news about the future economy drives prices down today through the discount rate effect. So uh, I just you brought that up, and that's so beautiful because we keep getting these questions about how is this course practical, and I keep going blah 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 because I have no idea how the course is practical, and, and you brought up a good one. You mentioned idiosyncratic. Uh, now there is this whole branch of literature on how um, in business cycles more idiosyncratic risk can itself become a state variable. That's one of the uh, potential explanations of HML, which is uh, it's it's not just labor income risk. It's it's not that you think on average you're going to lose your job, but there is there's more spread in the tails. The bigger chance of idiosyncratic bad events has gotten bigger. Um, that's that's a literature that's gotten revived recently. But I want to emphasize, circling back to Yuki's question, uh, what were Fama and French about? Which is we're going to spend a whole week on this in part two as well. That paragraph, that beautiful paragraph about labor income risks and so forth, you notice. It's on about page 50 of the paper. Now, what is the central theoretical idea doing on page 50 of a paper, not uh, on page one of a paper where you think it belongs? Well, Fama and French, it, a lot of that model is an APT. A lot of the model says, look, we understand size and book to markets by reference to this one factor, which is sort of empirically determined. And the, the whole point of that paper is for 90% of what you do in finance, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Uh, what, it, what it's saying is, look, here's 15 different anomalies. These are all versions of the value anomaly. And, and that's the central point of the paper. And for, for people in practice to learn, oh, I have the new, I don't know, whatever, the phase of the moon effect, and to learn that's explained by, by betas on value, that, that decreases the size of puzzles in the asset markets, leaving for, for for 90% of what you do, it doesn't matter what the fundamental macroeconomics are of it. 
that's why the fundamental macroeconomics can be safely left for future research and for page 50 of the paper. Um, so it does make sense to do what they do. Yuki, that was a great question. Got, do you have another one for us? Three like this and we'll be done with the hour. <laughs> Yuki, what else is on your mind? Uh, uh, so, uh, for now, I don't have another question. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're, okay. If, if more occurs to you, especially on what we're doing this week uh, in the class, uh, pipe up. You have the, move your head a little to the right. Your whole head. Yeah, yeah could go like this. Okay, yeah, you have the most interesting poster of any of us in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That's my co-worker's poster, so... You've got the manga, mine. Manga, the manga calendar back there. I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Adam, what you got for us from the poster? From the, uh, from the I, I, besides the poster, I have a question from Chago, and I moved over here to the whiteboard, so I wanted to write something there. Let me know if you can see what I write um, behind yeah. me. So Chago has an end, uh, a question about week five, and in particular about um, expected R star. Can you see that? That's one? great. Is that good? Or is yeah. that too, too small? All right. So he, he asks, I understand that E of R E um, star R E star is excess return. Um, then assuming that this is also equal to so the, the length of each of these vectors how much can you still see you can swing your uh, you can swing your uh, computer a little bit yeah that's better that's good right there uh, times uh, cosine um, of theta okay and then and he says this is this is the case because cosine of theta is equal to one. These guys are sort of on the same plane. Yep. And then he asks, can we then conclude that the length of the Oh, I love this. A paradox. Because, of course, you know the answer to the last one is no. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, right? So R E star, why do you know it's no? It's a random variable. I mean, in general, it's a random. In, in general, it's a random variable. In fact, it's always a random variable. Uh, it can't be one. I'll show you why in a second. Now, so what went wrong? Boy, you know, my coffee isn't quite working yet, and I have to figure out. <laughs> just uh, I, the first equation that's showing up, e of re star, re star equals re, right? That is wrong. Uh, the defining property of re star, let's get that one right. The defining property of re star is that e of re star times any re is the expected value of that re. Here, I, I'm going to get out. Now we're going to have the battle of the se second equation, not the first equation. Uh, yes. All right. Whoops. But this is great. This is exact. How do you learn things in life? You, you have to go through a hundred different paradoxes that don't make sense and work them out, and, and that's how you learn things. So uh, the, the, the mistake in the uh, here, uh, this is the actual E of RE uh, for all RE in RE. Can you move your whiteboard a little yeah. back? Or, yeah, perfect. Okay, that is the correct equation, right? That uh, R E star is the it is the special excess return that generates the mean excess return. So go fix your equation. That's the se second equation on your board, one mark percentage point. That was a minus. So.
All right. Okay. So that, uh, I think that's where the puzzle comes from, is getting the definition wrong. Because now the second, uh, the, the uh, inner product notes thing that you have, that's correct. Um, uh, but it no longer, uh, so it is also true that, uh, let, let's do, now this is true for RE star as well. RE mm -hmm. star is a return in RE. So that's correct. Uh, and then uh, I like, so that, that's also our inner product. So that is the same as the magnitude of R E star squared. Uh, so we certainly conclude that that equals that, but we no longer conclude that uh, the magnitude, that R E, R E itself equals one, because R E itself vanished. Now what is true? Uh, it's close to true. R E star is the projection of one onto the space of excess returns. So the, the one, that, that one was, uh, was sitting out there somewhere, but it's not, uh, it's not one itself. It's the projection of one onto the space of excess returns, uh, not one itself. Now, I was almost tempted to say that's a special case. You know, if one were in the space of excess returns, then we'd be all set. It would be, in fact, one. But one can't be in the space of excess returns because the space of excess returns, it's a zero-cost portfolio. So, so you know, could it be that one is in the space of excess returns? If one were in the space of excess returns, then it should, then it would be true that R E star equals one. Yes, it would be true, right? Because the projection of one onto something that's in the space uh, is in the space. But that can't be the that can't be true. I guess what can't be true is that can't be true. That would be an arbitrage opportunity, right? An excess return is. Um, that it has a price of zero, a price of zero and a payoff that's one for sure, that's a glorious arbitrage opportunity. So we're, we're not going to see that. Um, any excess return has to have a, uh, it has to either give you zero or it has to give you positive amounts in some states of nature and negative amounts in other states of nature. Uh, Adam, can you help me out here? Was that a brilliant explanation or uh, is there more to say on this on this one? I think that that's good. I I think um, let's see if, if Thiago asked anything else. Yeah, he, in in general, he said he guess uh, he 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 didn't see how, why this was the case, why the magnitude of R E star was equal to one, but he was sort of struggling with with the in, interpretation. Then he a, a follow up question he R asks R is the magnitude of R E star is not equal to one. Right? Correct. Uh, one in fact. Typically, the magnitude, the magnitude of RE star, oh, we have a nice, there is something nice here. The magnitude of RE star is always going to be less than 1, because it's always going to be true that uh, RE, uh, RE star uh, plus um, that error term equals 1. Nina! Good morning, Nina. Good morning. Good evening. Yeah, good morning. Whatever it is. Uh, Right, the projection of one on our E star means there's one. That's the projection on. A, that's the projection. That's the residual. Those are orthogonal to each other. So it's uh, so R E star squared plus epsilon squared equals one. That's true. So in fact, boy, we we've got about ten quiz questions out of this uh, out of this here that uh, I got to put in for next year. This is just fantastic. Proves or a final exam question. Boy, we're dying for new stuff. Prove that the magnitude of R E star is less than one. We just did it. Uh, is R E star equal to one? No. R E star is the projection of one onto the space of R E. Uh, can well look, think of all these questions. Can uh, is it possible that R E star is equal to one itself? That the projection of one onto R E, you know, that that R E is in that space, so the projection of one onto R E, you know, is that at least a special case? No, that's not possible because a payoff of one and a price of zero is the world's greatest arbitrage opportunity. Uh, well, how, is the magnitude, of our e, the magnitude of our E star, do we know anything about it? Yes, we know the magnitude of our E star is strictly less than one because it's the projection plus a residual. And, and one more lovely feature of this, this geometric language. I mean, how would I have ever thought of that without thinking of projecting down on a plane in the residual, at least at least for me, the geometric language makes sense of all these uh, identities that wouldn't have made sense otherwise. So uh, at, at least, Tiago, thank you for the great quiz questions. Uh, <laughs> we'll bedevil next year's students for sure.
Uh, Yuki, how are you doing? Uh, we, yeah, should, we should use your presence to help. Was that clear, or, there, or do you think you're the representative of the other students out there? Okay. Right. Yeah, I think the, uh, the mathematics uh, calculation is, I think, is uh, straightforward. Yeah, the math here is always straightforward. It's the intuition that's <laughs> befuddling. Nina, are, are, uh, so how did the table tennis tournament go? Nina, it turns out, is a professional uh, table tennis player, and we a tournament on Sunday. Yeah, go? I mean, it was okay. I didn't win. There were 130 people participating. I went through, so I was not too too bad, but not too good. Not good enough to win. That's, that's good. What I wish I knew is to be uh, a great tennis table tennis player, but not good enough in order to distract you from becoming a great finance professor. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, do you have? Uh, do you have a? Uh, uh, are you? Do you have a question you have for us, or are you not quite ready yet? And you'd like uh, Adam to go next. Um, probably it's probably it would be better if Adam is. Uh, okay. Adam, go and, and you uh, have a sip of coffee and. Uh, Definitely. And catch up with us. I, I have a question from Tom. Tom is a management consultant from San Francisco. And Tom has read um, a paper by uh, Sislak, uh, Edir Morris, and Edith uh, Wiesing Jørgensen, uh, a paper called uh, Stock Returns Over the FOMC Cycle. It's a, it's a follow up paper uh, to a Luca and uh, Monk paper called Pre FOMC Announcement Drift. So Tom says, this paper claims that the entire equity premium for the recent 20 years period was earned in weeks in which there was news that came from the Federal Reserve about either monetary policy or the macroeconomy. They don't uh, specify a model, but they say that the results reflect uh, a risk premium for news. Um, and then Tom asks, can you help me interpret this in terms of what we have already learned in the course. I think this is ICAPM, but I'm not sure. Um, why do they and Luke and Monk evaluate the cross-sectional response to, new, to Fed news in terms of a CAPM model? Ah, oh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, so this is a fascinating uh, bit of research. Uh, I, I have read I can, there's a series of papers. I've read some of them. I haven't read others. I'm going to get confused which ones I've read and which I haven't. Adam, Nina, help me out if I if I get the facts wrong here. There's, there's two salient facts. One of them, uh, one of the previous papers in this. Uh, well, let, let, let's try to get the simple fact. Um, if you think of how stock returns work, you know, stock stock prices go up and down, and then they often you know do something big on days when there's a news news announcement. And then they go up and down again, and they do something big on a day of a news announcement, and they go up and down again, and they do something big on, on days of news announcements. That, that is, in fact, how, how stock returns move. So there's, there's news announcements and there's other days. And now uh, what these authors have done is they look at the days in which there are Federal Reserve news announcements. Now this divides into there's, there's two. One is that on the announcement itself, stocks go up and down. The other fascinating thing is that there's a lot of stock return for the period just before the announcement. These are two separate uh, phenomena, which I'll talk about in a second. But let's start with on, on the days in which there are news announcements. Let's add up all of these guys here, all of the, uh, all of the uh, let's just look separately on the returns on the days when there are news announcements versus the other return days. And, and amazingly, surprise, surprise, the entire equity premium seems to come on the days of, of FOMC news announcements or surrounding FOMC news announcements. By which I mean that, that on average, so you know, sometimes it, it goes, sometimes the non-announcement period goes up, but sometimes the not here, the non-announcement period went down. So there's, there's a big averaging here about the, what happens in the non-announcement, the announcement periods. And what they're saying is that that really, once you look at averages. The picture is sort of like this. Uh, you know, on average, all the increase is is held during the news announcement uh, periods. Now that uh, you know that that's that's not an irrationality or something wrong. Uh, it, uh, if if the way the world works is all of the systemically important news comes out on those days, then holding stocks on those days is going to be 
the time you earn the premium, and holding stocks on other days is going to be the time you don't earn the premium. Um, uh, right? Because it basically says, suppose, suppose beta on consumption growth is zero in these time periods. It, stocks move around, but they have beta zero on consumption growth. The beta on consumption growth suddenly switches to one on the day of a news announcement, uh, and then the beta on consumption growth is zero otherwise. Then you would see this pattern: that equity premiums on zero on these days, and on. so that's that's where I th the the idea of constructing a model where news announcements shocks the important macroeconomic, and then that that makes perfect sense. So why I'm a little bit skeptical uh, because I'm I'm getting on in years, and I've read a lot of these papers, and it turns out. If you start looking at data like this, there's like six different ways of sorting where all of the premium is earned on X date. And I'm trying to remember, so I think the entire equity premium is earned on earnings announcement days as well. And the entire equity premium is earned on the days when the Fed makes announcements. And the entire equity premium is earned on the on when the moon is in the rise. And the entire equity premium is earned on days when there's thunderstorms. I'm making the last two up. But you, you can see the problem. Once you start sorting through the data, there's so much volatility in here that it's fairly easy to find other events, uh, you know, events like you know, this day and this day. The days in, in which the Treasury Secretary sneezed might be those days. And if you keep fishing around enough, it's quite easy to find uh, other kinds of news events that account for the entire equity premium. So that's a, a little bit of my skepticism on the basic fact. Uh, is is uh, that I've seen many other, uh, and we can't account for 800% of the equity premium. <laughs> the problem is this this technique is too successful, and there are too many kinds of news that account for 800% of the equity premium. And my other, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of the power of the Federal Reserve uh, to uh, uh, to cause the entire equity premium. That, that's kind of it would if it if it true it would be a damning com commentary saying that the Federal Reserve is inducing uh, the entire systematic risk. I mean, Milton Friedman would be proudly sitting up in his grave and clapping, I think. Right? Because it, what it says, the Fed, when the Fed tells you what they're doing, they don't say, we're here driving macroeconomic uncertainty. They say, we are here stabilizing the economy, making things wonderful. So a Fed announcement that they're going to do something uh, should, should be reflecting uh, news that's already in markets. If in fact the Fed were driving the entire equity premium, that means they are inducing uh, all of the uncertainty and volatility that, that causes a systematic risk. Boy, I hope that isn't true. Now, I, I probably have stepped, I've probably, just as a disclaimer, uh, I, I haven't read this particular paper recently. I probably mischaracterized it. If so, my apologies uh, to the authors, but that is my sense of the general set of ideas and how, how they make sense. Uh, and, and how there's some danger, though, there's, there's a danger of fishing around and finding too many kinds of days that account for the entire equity premium. We used to have the January effect. Oh, here's another one. It used to be a stylized fact that the entire equity premium was earned on January 1st, uh, the, the turn of the year effect. And once you start looking for seasonals, I saw another paper, it was something like the entire equity premium was earned uh, on the, uh, the month after the World Cup. So it was something like the World Cup bounce or something of the sort. So I've got to be careful uh, with empirical work. John, is it your sense that sort of if if we wanted to characterize these big jumps, that they primarily come from higher volatility, or sort of if if I wanted to higher volatility in all the stocks, or larger correlation between the stocks? So so now I'm if I'm trying to take this literature seriously, I would say, is, well, if there are news, earning news, or Fed news, or news about the moon, does that cause sort of all the stocks to, to be more volatile, or is it just the fact that there's sort of, there are, there's an idiosyncratic shock, and then there's a common shock, and, and when there's a common shock about the moon or the Fed, then all the stocks in the index are sort of more synchronized and, and correlation goes up. Does that does that distinction make sense? That's a great uh, question, and we've got like 10 PhD theses can still be written on that question. <laughs> the one thing well, I should write mine then. No, no, no. It's, it's just, the, what's great thing about finance is there's so many, you know, there's so much low-hanging fruit uh, if you just go out and uh, freeze. 
Uh, and this issue of time varying correlations is one of them. I, I can tell you one reference point that I've thought about, and this certainly was in 2007 and 2008. There was this big thing about, oh, all the correlations are, are going together. All stocks move down together. Our, our hedging models don't work anymore. Um, and I think uh, that's a case we're thinking, uh, uh, let's think of uh, R, uh, REI, I'm going to write an equation, equals alpha I plus beta uh, I times return on the market, uh, T, T plus epsilon I, T. Um, if you think in factor models, if you think in, car so the observation, let, let's, let's write, you know, the covariance of REI, REJ is rho IJ uh, uh, times sigma I times sigma J. And uh, if you think of your risk management in terms of covariance matrices, uh, you notice, oh my gosh, the correlations all went up on a big market movement when the market moves together. When the market goes down, the correlations all go up. And people who wrote covariance matrices and assumed the correlation matrices were stable blew out their position limits and their hedge funds went under. But uh, if, if you think in terms of a uh, breakdown of systematic and idiosyncratic, then it's just perfectly natural. Suppose there's big news about the market as a whole. Big market movement, that thing is big, with no unusual idiosyncratic news. What's going to happen? Well, when, when if there's a big movement of that and, and the usual amount of idiosyncratic news, the correlations between the two stocks are going to be much higher. In fact, if, if there's a big market movement and no idiosyncratic right? If that happens, then correlations are all one. So um, uh, let's, let's write an equation here. To, uh, sigma squared of REI equals uh, beta I squared, sigma squared of REM plus sigma squared of epsilon I. Right, so if the, and now let's add T's, if we get a time of huge market volatility, fall of 2008, lots of things about aggregate, systemic events like that, of course a time of huge uh, market volatility, oh, I, the one I should have written down, I should have written, sorry, sigma of REI, REJ, is beta I, beta J, uh, sigma squared of REM, uh, plus covariance of epsilon i, epsilon j. Uh, yeah. So uh, on a day where there's a huge, if market volatility goes up, then covariances are going to go up. But but it, uh, th then then the common then correlation coefficients are going to go up because this common component goes up like crazy. Uh, so this is this is uh, uh, this certainly happened in the financial. We had lots of market volatility, news about the market, resulting in high correlations between individual stocks. Now that so that's that that kind of restates that wasn't your question, but that's an answer <laughs> that I know about an event that happened in the data. And certainly, if you want to think about correlations between securities, I think breaking it down into factor model. This is a factor model of variance. Just as a review, factor means three different things. It means factor models of variance. It means expected return beta models, and it means things that can forecast returns. Factor is misused in three different ways. This is factor models of variance. And thinking about covariance matrices in terms of factor models and time-varying volatilities of factors, I think is a, a better way to understand time-varying correlations between things than just thinking in terms of raw covariance matrices that move over time. Now, Adam, I answered is something quite different from what you asked. Let's try and relate what I said to what you had in mind. <laughs> I have a comment on this. Oh, please, Nina, because yeah, you're actually working on this stuff. A bit. Um, so it um, sounds to me that it's related to the uh, network literature, which is appearing right now, and about on the spillovers, not only between returns, but also uh, risk and volatility spillovers, which uh, exist uh, not only across stocks, but also across uh, different uh, asset markets. Uh, one example is the recent S uh, decision by Swiss National Bank to unpack the Swiss franc. It caused uh, the um, appreciation of Swiss, huge appreciation of Swiss franc, but also Swiss stock market has dropped by 10% on that day, which was the largest drop uh, over the last 20 years in Switzerland. 
Um, I also am aware about the recent work by Merton about the interconnection between different credit spreads of different uh, banks and insurance companies. And he has shown that during the crisis, uh, that there is much more dependency across uh, the CDSs from banks and insurance compa companies as it was before the crisis. Oh, wait, wait. So the last one is that the correlation of CDS between banks and insurance companies. Yes, also in legs. Uh, so he considers kind of a VAR model, so it's there are also significant legs uh, in, in explaining the spread. Okay, so boy, oh boy, did you say a lot of fascinating things there. First of all, um, so be careful of language. And it's very popular these days to write articles about spillovers and contagions and networks and, and so forth. And that, so the big question is, as all, always in economics, is it correlation or is it causation? Two things happen roughly at the same time. Did A cause B? Or did some other event move both A and B at the same time? So uh, this is the whole question of systemic. If Lehman Brothers goes down and AIG goes down, did Lehman's failure cause AIG to go down? Had the government propped up Lehman, would that have kept AIG from going down? Or was there some third thing going on that made both of them go at the same time? Uh, the word spillover and contagion um, it makes you think about a causal chain from A to B. And of course, your first, and this is just to get, get your detectors ready, so you know how to, to raise your hand in the seminar and say, wait a minute, not just the seminar, in your own work. Um, is that really spillover and contagion? Uh, or is that both of them responding to the same thing? Or is it, if one goes and then the other goes, well, maybe it was the expected uh, movement in this that, that made that thing move. And this is, but this is fast. This is, you know, a lot of what's going on. I don't want to sound like a, like a, uh, like, like an old grumpy guy. Uh, are there these spillover effects? Uh, you know, the first time around in the European debt crisis, everybody was saying we can't let Greece go under because that'll lead to contagion, and the rest of Europe will then go under. So we got to prop up Greece. Now, you know, how does that work? I, th I think let's let's just make sure. In the popular press, it's like automatic, but you, you know you got to think of a mechanism. What did you? If Greece decides to not pay off its debts, what did you learn on the day after that default that you didn't already know about Greek finances? Why should that have an effect? Well, maybe if Italy had lent Greece a lot of money, then Greece going under could cause Italy to go under. But Italy didn't lend Greece a lot of money, so why should Greece going under have anything to do with whether Italy goes under? Well, maybe Greece going under means we learn the Germans aren't going to bail out Greece, so that makes us update that the Germans aren't going to bail out Italy. Aha! Now we know why Greece going under might have a contagion of Italy, but that's very different from sort of the mechanical market CX boom they make. Okay, so sorry, I, you used those words, and that sent me off on a tirade, uh, but that's an important tirade. Um, in finance, there's so many words that get used, like, like spillover, contagion, liquidity spiral, fire sale, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, be careful when you start using those words. Second thing you said, uh, the contagion from the Swiss uh, central bank uh, abandoning its peg to uh, stocks going down 10%. So I just have two comments on that event. Um, when you say we're going to do what it takes, you may better make sure that everybody knows you're going to do what it takes. Uh, and the poor Swiss central bank said we're going to put a cap on and then, and then like a trillion euros later, <laughs> realized what trouble they were in. I found that event puzzling to the opposite. Why did Swiss stocks not go down more? Uh, because, think about it, the Swiss, okay, the, the Swiss banks, the central bank says, we give up. We're going to let, and the Swiss franc appreciates, what, 20% in a day? How much did it go up? Uh, the currency, or? Yeah, the currency went up like 20%, right? Yeah, or even 30 percent, actually. 30%. I would think that the marginal buyer of Swiss stocks would be a German guy or gal, right? So in euros, if the Swiss currency goes up 30 uh, percent, in you and the stocks stay the same in euro terms, then the Swiss stock market should go down exactly 30 percent. 
right? I mean, if there's if there's going to be purchasing power parity working in anything, it ought to be in widely internationally held stocks. Swiss stocks are, are what? It's like pharmaceutical companies who are, uh, you know, my pension fund. I, I have the world stock portfolio. I'm sure I've got some of this stuff. So if, if you're selling a something that's basically held around the world on world markets, shouldn't its euro price be constant, not its Swiss franc price? So the puzzle for finance researchers is not why did Swiss stocks go down measured in Swiss francs. The puzzle for international finance workers is why did Swiss stocks go up 20% when measured in euros on the day that the Swiss central bank gives up its peg? Um, you know, if, now you might say, "Oh, prices are sticky," so on and so forth. But most of the Swiss stock market are international companies selling things in international markets. So a Swiss pharmaceutical company that sells 90% of its product, 99% of its product in Europe, in, in Eastern Europe, in the United States, in Brazil. If the Swiss franc goes up, the only news about that company is that their 5% of their employees that are actually in Switzerland are going to have to be paid more. That should be bad for the company. So, uh, you know, that was the puzzle. Uh, then the credit spreads thing you mentioned. This is fascinating. I wasn't aware of this paper. Um, it certainly has become uh, insurance companies are being treated as systemically important. I'm not clear, sure why. Uh, they're becoming sort of more like banks. That their credit spreads are linked is fascinating. Linking with leads and lags, that should, there's a quiz question in this. Right? That's sort of a, a, a violation of efficiency. That's a predictable return. If you can see the credit spread on, 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 a, on a bank going up and you know two weeks from now the credit spread on an insurance company is going to go up. Well, you know, you should be shorting their bonds today and making a huge fortune. So, my my, how can this possibly be true? Uh, uh, question mark goes up uh, on that. But I haven't read the paper, so so. Uh, great. Thank you for this comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Looks like we got Leonard back with us. Hi there. Hello. Hi there. Uh, and in, in breaking from previous tradition, I wanted to ask a simple question. Um, <laughs> could you discuss examples of over-identifying or under-identifying in the GMM model? I was trying to catch, what, since I was sort of at the end of that lecture, what if you have simple examples that you could discuss. Thank you. Uh, we are supposed to... This is kind of turns into John's ranting and raving about stories in the financial press, if we're not careful. <laughs> uh, but I have a blog for that. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going to, uh, while I think, I'm going to erase my blackboard. So there is this fancy, a lot of GMM is translating this fancy terminology into perfectly normal stuff. Uh, Over-identified, exactly identified, and under-identified. Uh, technically, it means, um, so how many moment conditions do you have? It, right, is how many facts do you have? And how many parameters are you going to estimate? So. If you have uh, uh, one moment and one parameter, then you can exactly identify, that's exactly identified, meaning you have one fact and one parameter, you can estimate that one parameter, but you, there's nothing left to test. Um, now, uh, let, here, a good example where that might be confusing is GMM applied to ordinary least squares. So let me, let me pick that example. That's an example, so exact identification, the way we mapped ordinary least squares into GMM is an example of exact identification. So we used the, the moment condition that we used was E of, um, uh, let me try to get this right, um, of y minus, yt minus xt b. That's the, this is the error term. So we said that times xt, I'm leaving out the constant, equals zero. Uh, Right, that that was our that's our moment condition. That's the thing we call uh, G T uh, E T of that G T of B uh, equals zero. I'm I'm gonna get my I, I'm not I may not get my B's and my B hats and all and the T's in the right place. But you with me? That's what we did with GMM. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example to talk about. So uh, that right? This says just set set X T set the sample errors orthogonal to the uh, sample right-hand variables. That defines the GMM estimate. And uh, from that, just in case you're, uh, anybody's still asleep, 
that means that b hat equals et of xt xt prime inverse uh, et of uh, uh, yep, 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 yeah, xt, y, uh, y is xt, right, uh, xt, yt, uh, or x prime x inverse x prime y. So, what have I done? I've simply reminded you how our mapping of uh, OLS into GMM works. Why? Because it's an example of exact identification. So the way we did this, we have one moment if x is a scalar, and one parameter b. And that means that we are going to do GMM by setting in sample that moment to zero every time. So that's one moment, one parameter. That's called exact identification. What can we do in that circumstance? Well, you can certainly estimate the parameter, but you can't test the model. Now, what do you mean you say you can't test it? We know how to do B tests. You can test hypotheses. There still is a sigma of B hat formula still exists. And you can use that to test hypotheses like, is b hat equal to zero? You can test that hypothesis, but you can't, there's no model here to test. There's no over-identifying restrictions test. So in the case of exact identification, you can estimate a parameter, you can, uh, it, the, but there's no, the over-identifying restrictions is, is there's two facts to miss, make, make, get the parameter. They don't exactly work well, and so there's some tension, and you can test the overall model. This is, you know, there's no overall model to test. You can test hypotheses about the parameters, but that's not the same thing as testing a model. So that's exact identification. May, let me do an over-identification example and an under-identification example, and maybe that, uh, by doing an example, that will clarify what the words mean. So let's, the classic, let me just, the classic over-identification example would be, uh, let's see, let's do E of uh, CT plus one over CT to the minus gamma times return a t plus 1, return b t plus 1. Let's make these excess returns uh, uh, equal to 0. Uh, e, uh, so that's the, that's the g of gamma equals 0. That's in population. So suppose we have two assets, the consumption-based model. These are excess returns, so I got rid of the beta. Now we have two moments. And we have one parameter gamma. And that there's no way to make in sample both of those moments exactly equal to zero. If you if you make RA equal to zero, RB is gonna pop up. It's like whack-a-mole. Set RA equal set E of that times RA equals zero, RB comes up. Set E of that times RB equals zero, RA comes up. You can't set them both equal to zero. You gotta have some trade-off. So that's a, the classic example of over-identification. In your problem set on GMM. We had, uh, as a function of gamma hat, I had you do gt of gamma. Uh, and what you saw is that for, uh, I, I called this, it was different, it was ra or rb. Uh, what the problem looked like is that rb, there were two moments, and one of them needed a lower value of gamma than the other one. So you, there was no single value of gamma that made both of them equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So now what did, you, what did you do? Well, you said, well, We'll take some linear combination of the two. We'll take some, uh, what I had you work out was both the minimization approach and the linear combination approach. And you ended up, you know, if you, if you take, uh, if you take let, let's do half and half. Let's do A equals 1, 1. So you're trying to minimize both. Then that is what the green line is what uh, 1 half of G, I'm going to write as 1 half GA plus 1 half of GB. Uh, uh, is that clear enough? That's just one half of this thing plus one half of that thing. Mm -hmm. um, we can set that linear combination to zero and get a gamma halfway in between them, but that's a compromise. Right? At that value, uh, one of the g's is going to be positive, one of the g's is going to be negative. They're not both going to be zero. So this is an example of over-identification. What can you do? You can still estimate the parameter. You could estimate. You could just. You could estimate the parameter with that one, or you could estimate the parameter with that one. Since they're giving you different answers in sample, the GMM estimate's going to be some compromise of the two. We're going to talk about weighting the two moments, and then you can test. You can say, wait a minute. Uh, you know, these things should be. It should work the same way in population. Well, of course, there's sample variability. These are the GTs, not the actual Gs. 
maybe this fact that we can't hit the, that they're not both equal to zero at the same place, maybe that's just, just due to sampling error, that's the over-identifying restrictions test. So that's an example of over-identified, which is the normal, you know, healthy case uh, over, well, I shouldn't say that. Typically in asset pricing, we'll have, you, you want to have fewer parameters than moments, so you have something left to test. In the Fama French model, we've got two parameters. You've got the, the market prices of risk, but you've got 25 different assets, and so you've got 25 alphas that should all be zero. The over-identifying restrictions test is, well, are those 25 alphas really all zero? So now you've got over-identification. What's an example of under-identification? Uh, cl the classic example of under-identification would be if we had um, uh, 1 equals uh, E of beta uh, CT plus 1 over CT to the minus gamma uh, oops, times, if you had only a single asset return on the market, T plus 1, well, now you have two parameters and one moment. So now not only can you estimate beta and gamma, but there's lots of different betas and gammas that'll give you the same, that, so this, you can nail this, but there's different betas and gammas that can nail the same thing. You can't you, can, you can't tell which of many possible combinations of beta and gamma it is. Uh, that, 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 so, so you have ideally an embarrassment of riches. You, you, can't, you can't unique, that's like having more parameters than you have, uh, than, than you have right-hand variables in a, in a regression. So that's under-identified, and uh, um, yeah, it just is what it is. It's too easy. This you can set exactly to zero, but there's, too, there's many different versions of the parameters that set that equal to zero. Over-identified, you can't set both moments to zero at the same time, so there's some tension, and that means there's something to test. Exactly identified means you can exactly, you, you, there's one moment, one parameter, you can measure it, you can, you can test it, its values, but you can't test whether the model is right. The model being right means the same gamma works for multiple. Leonard, it seems like I've lulled you into... Uh, no, no, it, it all makes sense. Um, what, what, what about uh, categorical variables where things are not continuous but just can have two states? So where one is one might be positive and one's negative and you can't really get zero, but you the world can be in one of these two different, you know, like a high volatility or a low volatility regime. Well, uh, so remember GMM is all about asymptotic distribution theory. Okay. Uh, it's all so uh, we really don't make uh, distributional assumptions. So mm -hmm. econometrics, where you make assumptions like there's a normal distribution is when you want finite sample results. So mm -hmm. we find to have categorical variables so long as you can map what you want to do with the categorical variables. Into, well, let's suppose that uh, you, know, you have xt, which is either rain or shine, uh, right? Uh, then, then if you want, it, as long as you can map what you want to do with those categorical variables into something like, you know, what is mu equals e of x? Well, you know, 1 over t sum of, uh, let's let rain equals 1 and shine equals 0, 1 over t sum of xt, you know, that's a case where we can measure the mean probability, that the mean chance of rain by a sample mean, and then, uh, you know, sigma of mu hat, the, the mu hats will, the, the mu hats will be normally distributed, uh, you know, over, over different samples because even though the underlying random variables are discrete, the sum by the central limit theorem is a normal distribution. So we can talk about an asymptotic distribution theory of, of averages of these variables. So there's nothing wrong with applying GMM to categorical variables. Nina, you want to jump in? No, no. Oh, okay. You had that look on your face of John is saying something stupid again. Uh, no. Yeah, I, I was only concerned that the categorical variables don't really mean anything because you could have called it four and zero instead of one and zero, and, the, and therefore that could screw up the math of it, making the expected expected value zero or one, and when you set up the equations, does it, or is that all normalized away? Uh, well, yeah, define your units. Uh, right. If you do if you do asset returns, let me strongly advise you understand: Are you looking at net returns, gross returns, percent returns, lot returns, and over what horizon? And if you do that up, you're in trouble, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Adam or Nina, do we have some uh, important questions in the forum we should get to before we... Uh, there, there are, there are two, two questions on GMM from this week that, I've, that I thought were, were very interesting. Um, 
or are, are important at least. So the first is from uh, Eduardo. Eduardo is from Peru. And he has a question about GMM. He says, Professor Cochran mentioned something about choosing robust moments. What, what is actually uh, the meaning of robust? For example, if we estimate a model that fits the data well and make uh, good uh, out of sample predictions, but it gives us uh, potentially unreasonable estimates, uh, like beta equal to 0 and gamma equals to 100, uh, how should we interpret this? Yeah, so this is a case. There is a whole theory of robust statistics, as there's a whole there's a whole Bayesian theory about how you're supposed to do stuff formally that we all do kind of informally. Uh, and, and I'm not going to be very so robust is uh, the way Gene Fama would do it. <laughs> that was only half a joke. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I think I think Eduardo's example is a good one. If if you have something that uh, looks like it fits the data well but has ridiculous economic parameters, you know you're in trouble. And gamma equals 100 is another. Uh, it's another. Th there's a problem set on GMM where we had very high gammas, and you saw the result was that uh, we had good-looking moment conditions, but I had I had uh, I had you plot. What did uh, CT plus 1 over CT to the minus 100, uh, what did that look like? And the answer was it's supposed to look like this. Um, and so what you learn is, of course, the covariance of that with returns depends on entirely on what happens on those two days. <clears throat> now, maybe that's a fact. Maybe what you're discovering is that, is that uh, rare disasters, in fact, high-risk aversion, is a rare disasters theory. In fact, it's going back to Nina's question. <laughs> this is almost like the all that matters for asset pricing is whether returns go up or down on those two days. And it doesn't matter what happens on the other days. Well, maybe that's a fact. Maybe that's the way the world works. But um, high risk aversion coefficient, that's also not robust in the sense of, uh, you know, you had, by, by, by you think you have 800 data points you really have two data points. And so what happens on those two days is very sensitive to timing differences, to data measurement differences, and so forth. So it's it's not that kind of prediction, while maybe true, is is not robust to small differences in how you specify the model. So that's I think really robust means that um, small differences in specification, small differences in the model shouldn't make a big difference in results. Unfortunately, despite the theory of robust statistics, um, so much of what we do, any paper you do, you make 250 choices. Do I do daily, weekly, monthly? Do I do adjust for bid-ask spreads? Do I not adjust for bid-ask spreads? Do I use non-durable consumption, services consumption? Do I include the government? Do I not include the government? What do I do about durables? How do I deflate things? You know, there's all these hundreds of ways of doing things. And you want to give people a sense that your final answers really don't matter with respect to all of these choices. Uh, now that's really a, uh, first of all, you have to try about 80 of the things. <laughs> and then you have to do things in such a way that they're transparent, that people can see what you're doing. That's why big black boxes uh, tend to be, dis why we tend not to do them in finance. In physics, you know, in climate science, they just build some huge model. And, and you know that you can throw stuff in and not but in, in finance we try to make our procedures more transparent and and connected to stylized facts that people can can see for themselves if I say this model is built on the fact that stocks go down in recessions that's something say oh yeah that makes sense if I say this model is built on the fact that stocks seem to go down at 1157 on Mondays in, in, in a blue moon eh, you say that's not so robust so it, it is an art form, uh, and there's not much more I can say about the art form of robustness. Uh, other than read papers, see what you find convincing, like read Gene Fama papers, and do like that. <laughs> Study the mechanisms of both producing results that, that, that are transparent and convincing to you, and, and try to improve on those, try to be convincing to everybody else. You said you had another one. Well, let's take time for yes. a, a short GMM question. A, a, a short GMM question. This I, I found this question sort of it's 
It doesn't have much to do with, with what we usually do, but it might be a fun very last question. It's from uh, Miro Peter. And he says, um, hello, Professor John, Nina, uh, Adam, the team. Thank you for your efforts and the possibility to learn with you. I have a background in classic applied math and a long career in the shipping industry. And his question is, in the shipping markets, particularly in ordering, ordering new build ships is, is very erratic. And he finds that, that ship owners use a rule of thumb approach and intuition. So Miro would be uh, interested in how can we apply GMM, uh, the GMM approach to, to problems for in, in sort of new estimators in shipping applications uh, sort of to, or other applications outside of financial economics. So yes, I thought that would be a good final question. Are there, how can the students take the tools that we've learned and apply them in their daily lives, in their professions, even if they're not financial economists? Okay, that, thank you, that is great. Now there is, I can't remember the authors, and tell me if you guys remember, there's a great paper on ship construction, uh, the finance of ship construction. Uh, Somebody will have to Google it and, and, and let us know where it is because I can't. I remember seeing it. I remember thinking it was beautiful. I can't remember what's here because here's the issue for shipping construction. Uh, you want to build a boat. It's a very expensive to build a boat, and it takes uh, three years to build the boat. I'm, I'm making up the numbers, but you know, three years to build a boat. So, and then the boat is is useful for about 20 years. So, in deciding should I build a boat now, you want to know is it going to be profitable starting three years from now? Now, of course. International trade takes uh, goes through business cycles like everything else, and shipbuilding is irreversible. Uh, irreversible in the sense that once you've built the boat, you've got the boat. <clears throat> so what you want to make sure is is are you, when you're building a boat, you want to know. It, so what happens is since there's all this installed capacity, it's a classic irreversible investment problem. There's all this installed capacity. So if the price of if the demand for shipping goes up, you make a lot of money because your competitors can't build ships fast enough to get them on the ocean. But then what can happen is, suppose the price, the demand for shipping goes down. The ships are there. The crews are pretty cheap. So your competitors are, are going to be willing to just cover variable costs uh, in, in keeping shipping going. So you're going to be losing money on a new ship. So you really want to make sure if you build a ship that it comes online in one of these times of, of high shipping demand, not that it comes on to, online in a five-year recession when, when people are losing money on ships. So the study was was looking at when do people order new ships. And it came to one of these sort of behavioral conclusions that they were doing that they were kind of extrapolate they were uh, extrapolating current and past prices and not rationally understanding that there was too much shipping being built and that there therefore that you know the ships would come on in us. So I don't know the answer, but if you're looking for a PhD thesis, I know there's a classic paper out there somewhere, and that this is such a beautiful uh, example of a. Um, uh, of an interesting problem, right? Uh, you, you, do, when do you build a ship? When is everybody else building a ship? There's a three-year lag uh, to getting the ship online, and you want to. And there's an irreversibility uh, uh, Q theory there. Uh, so the economics of shipbuilding are exactly amenable to the sort of dynamic programming, uh, uh, um, irreversible investment, with rational expectations, we hope, about, about uh, the, the profits of, of international trade. It's also something where, where you might want to build flexibility in. Can I use the same ship to, to, you know, to do two different things or build a, only one ship that does one thing perfectly? This is sort of a real options question. Uh, uh, I would assume that this would be generalizable to uh, all project finance, like building sports stadiums and roads and and then that, then you get into the whole thing about build, putting together a bankruptcy with special purpose to vehicles and whether government should fund this and whether it's a really a publicly traded asset, things like that. Exactly. Uh, project Irreversible project finance is really interesting. Now, the question was, can we use GMM? And I think that's the wrong question. Uh, the, question the right question is, can we use the basic uh, framework that we use to do consumption-based asset pricing on this framework, absolutely yes. Uh, you know, th it is the same. The, the the basic dynamic program we set up for doing a, a portfolio investment is exactly the same tool you would set up here. It would just have an interesting feature. There would be an, a time lag between when you decide to do it and when it gets done. There would be an irreversibility that once you do it, it's done. For most investors, there would be lumpiness to it. You can't just do a marginal bit of a ship. The rudder doesn't do you much good without the propellers. You got to do the whole ship, or you got to do nothing. 
Uh, so it, those tools are the ones that generalize. GMM is just is an empirical tool. Uh, GMM just says, uh, you, you know, when you want to measure something, translate the way you're going to measure it into taking the mean of something. And I got some formulas for you about the asymptotic distribution of sample means, uh, which is just a beautiful simplifying tool for anything you might want to do. If you want to, you know, measure one of these questions, are the ship builders doing the right thing? You know, okay, translate into average numbers of ships built when prices are going up, and then GMM can tell you uh, what the distribution theory of that thing is. So the, the real question is, does the dynamic programming uh, uh, asset pricing portfolio theory techniques that we use generalize to that question? The answer is yes, and, and I wish I could remember the name of the shipping paper. I think it's uh, called Waves in Ship Prices and Investments. There's a paper by Greenwood and Hansen in QJE. I can post the link on the forum. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that as just being a, a, just a lovely paper. I think it came to the wrong answer. Uh, but but Because uh, I always think if you just try a little bit harder, yes, it looks totally irrational, but there's some little piece of it that, that you left out that'll... that'll and, that, and this is just, just a question of taste. Do you get satisfaction out of saying, boy, the world is screwed up, they're all irrational, or do you get satisfaction out of working another three weeks and saying, oh, here's, here's the, the fixed cost that I left out and makes the pro problem work well. But I remember this just being a fascinating uh, paradox in that case. I mean, because if you look at, uh, if, if you, there's, there's uh, studies of bumblebees, and bumblebees solve the dynamic program of, of go to the flowers just beautifully, but, but none of them know how to solve a dynamic program. So. Uh, I sort of have the fact that people talk in strange ways doesn't dissuade me from hopes that they're behaving rationally. But we got to that. That's a that has to be confronted with the real world, uh, which is what was interesting about that paper. I think this is a beautiful note on which to conclude, uh, because part two of the course goes on to talk about many more side issues. Uh, it goes on to do we're going to do macroeconomics. We're going to do investment, uh, the Q theory of investment, which is about how do you build things when there's adjustment costs and time lags and so forth. Uh, so uh, come back. Uh, let's all take a week off, except me, which has to get the second part of the class going again. Uh, come back, and, and we'll talk about many more of these issues. Thank you, everybody. We done? Thank you. Thanks for joining Bye. us. Bye. 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 Bye.